On the Nevada-California state line, a geographically distinct population of sage-grouse once faced a precarious future. Today that's changed. A forward-thinking group of people representing ranchers, agencies, conservation groups, private citizens, and universities came together in 2002 to form the Bi-State Local Area Working Group. They agreed to work across borders of land and values for the common good of sage-grouse. In 2012, they released the Bi-State Action Plan, a document that represents on-the-ground successes from the past decade and guidance for the future. Conifer removal is one of the top conservation actions identified in the plan. Here is a success story of how some of the members of the group came together to create success for the bird and the land. Sage grouse are considered a sagebrush obligate species, meaning they use different components of the sagebrush ecosystem to meet their life history phases. For example, they use one component of the sagebrush ecosystem for nesting and another one for brood rearing and then uh, potentially other areas to winter. Each of these components of the sagebrush ecosystem are necessary for that population to persist, so they're tightly linked to sagebrush. Their diet really only consists of sagebrush during the winter, where about 95 to 100 percent of their diet is sagebrush leaves. Now within the bi-state area, which is on the border of California and Nevada, there hasn't been evidence of sage grouse populations declining or increasing in the last 10 years. And this is a study that was recently conducted by the USGS. This area, though, does have threats to sage grouse populations, long-term threats, such as conifer encroachment, largely pinion and juniper trees. Conifer is moving into these areas and replacing sagebrush. This is what we're seeing in the bi-state area. This has been going on for approximately 150 years, conifer expansion, and we've lost, it's estimated or thought about 30 to 35 percent of sagebrush habitat be, because of conifers. And what this has actually resulted in is sage grouse being, sage grouse populations being isolated into specific areas and loss of connectivity between those populations because of these large expanses of conifer. So in order to um, relieve some pressure and allow distribution of sage grouse to increase and populations to expand, it's important to carry out conservation actions that reverse this expansion process. In order to understand how PJ influences sage grouse populations, we need to have a, a nice representation of PJ on the landscape that we can use in our computation, something that's digital that allows us to uh, conduct our analyses on the landscape. So this is a typical image of what it looks like in the bi-state. A lot of pinion juniper encroachment, all the dark trees you see out there are, are actually pinion juniper trees. And what we've done is we've used highly specialized software to extract these trees at a one meter resolution to where we have something that looks like this of which we can conduct our analyses on, develop cover classes, which is the percentage of cover within a specific area, and relate that to grouse movement patterns and population vital rates like nest survival and adult survival across the landscape. Once we've calculated the cover classes, we could depict that or illustrate it on the landscape. And the, the green that you see here are the different classifications of pinion juniper cover. The light green actually represents the lower cover class, which would be phase one, and then the darker green, this green up in here represents uh, phase two and, and phase three. Uh, we're at the north end of the pine nuts and we are looking south down the pine nuts. This is a Google Earth image and we're going to take a tour down the pine nuts demonstrating the points. These are sage grouse locations which you see in purple that are derived from the GPS transmitters that are getting about 14 fixes per day on these birds. And you could see that most of the birds are within the sagebrush areas and then when we get into the PJ there's fewer birds. They're moving through it and you can see those kind of linear movements but then finding pockets of sagebrush like this where they're uh, where they stay. Then they're moving up onto the ridge top and these birds move south from the ridge top using small pockets of sagebrush in between the more or less phase one encroachment completely avoiding phase two and three and uh, this area right here depicts the Oriana a uh, uh, springs area where it's very important for broods and then we get down to the southern end of the uh, pine nuts where most of them end up in the fall and winter in these lar larger sagebrush patches and spend out the winter there and migrate back up 
during the spring season back up to Mill Canyon Lex site. Since 2010, the NRCS has contracted in this area, the Pine Nut Buckskin area, for over half a million dollars for sage grouse habitat improvement projects. Uh, we've contracted with the grazing permittees on BLM lands. And we've, so far we've cut over 2,000 acres of pinyon and juniper trees. And we have another 1,300 plus planned in the near future to be cut. Pinyon and juniper trees have historically been in the upper, higher elevation rocky areas, true woodlands. And they've, over the years, have been encroaching down into the sagebrush steppe habitats, which is what the sage grouse use. Okay, so this area is looking at um, Fred Fullstone's allotment. This has not been treated yet. Uh, what we're looking at is what we would call phase two pinion juniper encroachment. And what that means is basically the trees and the shrubs are like co-dominant with each other. And as this starts to transition into phase three, you'll start really losing the shrub layer and the other understory. And so this is ideal for treatment. We try to focus on the like phase one and phase two before it gets to phase three so that you can avoid losing that understory. And then when you cut these trees out, you'll still have a nice understory that can then come back and kind of revive. My name is Fred Fullstone. I've been ranching all my life. We've run around 15,000 sheep through the years and probably 1,500 head of cattle. Well, when we first started, there was uh, hardly any uh, PJ. We had uh, acres and acres of country, beautiful sage uh, brush, sage, uh, black sage, and uh, grasses. And we could run way more sheep in those early years. But this uh, PJ and pines have just encroached, just taken everything from here to Bridgeport. I just thought it was a project we needed and jumped at it right away. And I think we need more of it to clean up all this country. Yeah. This is just a starter. I started running cattle here in, in uh, 1993, so 21 years I've been on this allotment. Well, in the course of that time, we've had four fires consuming between uh, this allotment and another allotment next to it that I also uh, am the permittee on, the Sunrise allotment. It's burned approximately 10,000 acres in four different fires over the last uh, 18 years. Those fires consume PJ. It burns very intense and it, and it destroys all the understory under it. So, you know, it's just a long recovery period. So fire is not a good way to to control PJ as far as the, the range is concerned. So we're standing kind of in the middle of a 1,100 plus acre project of tree removal that we've done here, which goes the flat behind here as well as up the canyon behind uh, on the far side of the, of the view here. We just went in with crews. Uh, we used mastication crews with an excavator and chainsaws and we removed all the trees and actually cut them down and, and scattered them out or ground them up with a masticator. And all those trees that are, are out are, are still out here, but you that's how much understory was there you couldn't even see before. And now it's all just, you take the trees down and there it is. And it's all exposed to sunlight and the moisture is available for all that you see instead of all those trees. And it's good for the wildlife, other wildlife besides sage grouse and the, and the cattle. The uh, trees are um, ground, some of them are smashed or torn up, and they're under specifications to, you know, a certain height limit that is r required. Uh, the treatments that you see behind me were the primary um, beneficiary was the grass and sage community to keep that maintained and healthy more resilient resistance to disturbance, which also favors sage grouse. But a side benefit is also uh, the reducing the flammability and the resistance to control from fire management. So if a fire were to come through the area, uh, it would be much easier to control and uh, reduce fire size.
when the, the bison fire started on July 4th, uh, 2013, and uh, I happened to be in the helicopter flying the fire when it was burning in the east side of the Pine Nut Mountains, and uh, it was actively moving through the standing pinyon juniper canopy, very dense, overly stocked pinyon juniper stands. And with the treatments behind us, where the, the canopy was basically removed and, and put down on the surface, uh, we weren't very concerned about the fire moving onto the eastern slopes here because we knew that the fire had dropped down to the ground and become uh, much more manageable once it got into the treated areas versus the untreated areas. We are targeting sagebrush areas for removal that are specifically needed for sage grouse movement and habitat. So we have the science and the monitoring to show where the birds move and we're designing our vegetation treatments in these areas, prioritizing it across the landscape for the biggest bang for our buck for restoration. We've implemented several projects in collaboration with NRCS and a few of our permittees, and it develops a relationship, it develops common goals, and it, and it develops a way for us to get work done on BLM land that we may not have the money or the resources for. And so it's been a real positive aspect of our implementation of the project. Mm -hmm.